Yo, what's up? It's G Herbo Swervo. We're right here on Civil TV, man. Welcome to my neighborhood. My neighborhood, the thing I feel like, my neighborhood and you know just the area I grew up over east, east side of Chicago, um, pretty much from South Shore or Stony Island to South Shore Drive, just that radius from 75th to 79th, because um, I don't really want to just limit to like my one block because I learned so much different stuff like everywhere all over the east side of Chicago, you know, so. The stuff I learned early on was really you you gotta you gotta shape yourself into a man, you know, like that's what it taught me early. Like I had to become a man. Even when I was 16, 17, I was in the streets and really like playing the grown man's game. Like I was when I really like jumped off the porch and started hanging outside, I was hanging with like people 22, 23, 24, 16, you know, 17. So I gotta, I gotta act just like them, you know, like I can't really act like a 16, 17 year old or I, I would really be like a weak link, you know, it's a possibility that I could be a liability, anything, so I gotta be completely accountable for my actions the same way these guys are at 23, 24 years old, you know, when I got people trying to kill me and a bunch of other stuff that early, you know, so. I mean, the important influence, like, the thing with me when I came out as an artist, I wasn't really like labeling myself a drill artist, you know, even though like the drill movement was really what was big in Chicago. My whole thing was just getting my story out, you know, like even with drill music, it's, it's us just getting our story out. We all just articulated a different way, you know, like when Sosa was spitting all his, like Sosa that's drill music, you know, like he was really like the starter of drill music, you know, one of the creators. And that's him telling his story, you know, like he painted a picture for you in certain ways, the same way I did another way, you know, so I mean, you could label it drill or however, you know, from just the era which it was, which I was, you know, brought up, but I was more so like, my music is still similar to what Jay-Z did and what Nas did and what Wayne did, you know, like, so if you're really not going to label them drill rappers, I don't really like calling myself that, but I just was... You know, like the music scene was a way for me to get my story out. Like early on, I didn't believe, I didn't really believe, like, okay, I could become, you know, the star I am today through music. Like I knew it was possible, but that was really never my aim. I was just trying to tell my story, you know, like get you my standpoint from being on 79th and Essex every day as a 15, 16 year old boy, you know, and with my mindset that gotta think and live and do the thing that I do on a day to day basis. That's what my music was. Uh, my relationship to Bibby is literally a brotherhood, like, none more, none less, you know, like, that's my brother, you know. I do anything for him and I feel vice versa, he do the same for me, you know, we came up together, we was broke together, slept in the traps together slept in the same bed together, you know, that's my real brother, so the relationship between him, me and him is, is, you know, pretty straightforward, like, it's not a music relationship, you know, that been my homie since he's like 10 years old, so we really got like 10, 15 years in this shit now. At a young age, it took a toll because I started really like losing my friends to gun violence when, and it really, when it really hit me was when, you know, like other people like Vito, I'm 20, 22, I'm 23, Vito would probably be 30 if he was still alive, you know, like, I lost, that was like an a older guy in the hood I looked up to, you know, like, that was my big brother I'm looking up to in the hood, guys like him and Chico and all those guys, we looked up to him when we lost him, it hit us, but I feel like when it really hit home was when I lost Faison in 2010, what's up, big boy? When it really hit home was when I lost Faison in 2010, man, like, that was probably, like, my first real experience with like death real close to me and it was hard man it was hard real hard you know because i got one of my best friends farrakhan like that's his little brother and this is my man my right hand man who i'm with every day and just we got a close friend that lose a brother man it's it, you feel it you know it's painful and you don't understand his pain because it's not your brother that's being lost you know but you're looking at it like it's your brother because it's your brother so you really trying to replace 
that, you trying to be that. Like, I'm trying to be that brother that you lost, you know, but you could never be that. You get what I'm saying? Like, so when I lost Phase On in 2010, it was hard. It was probably like one of the hardest steps I dealt with early on. And, you know, like, I don't really like get emotional, you know, that's probably like one of the first times I cried at a funeral that wasn't like somebody in my family, you know. So. It was hard, man, and we really didn't understand that then. We still didn't understand it, like how close it was, you know, how easy it is to die, you know, like we still didn't understand it, you know, and that's probably what I had to grasp onto being in the streets because I lost more. It didn't get better, you know, like after him, it was rock after rock, it was Kobe after Kobe, it was Pee Wee after Pee Wee, it was Seema, you know, like it was. I was going psych, you know, we lost four homies in one summer. We lost Kobe, we lost Pee Wee, we lost Simo, we lost Richie Rich, all in one summer, you know, so. And I wasn't even 20, I wasn't even 20 yet. I only think I was 19, you know, like, I was young dealing with this, so. And still be able to understand what I'm going through and have to go outside the next day, cause we outside the next day living. Like, it ain't never happened, but it happened, but. We outside putting ourselves back in harm's way, cause. Is what we was up against, man. So I, I had to understand death early and understand putting myself in, you know, in a, in a line of fire, you know, and putting myself in possible never de de near death situations, like on, on a daily basis, you know, and it, it became normal to me. So that's really what was scary, like when you get into shootouts and high speeds and people trying to kill you, but it's normal, you know, it was normal to me. Things that I'm that I'm doing, you know, starting to do to help, it, you know, kind of get back to my community and not just my community, but like the whole city of Chicago. And I say a lot of times, like, if in order to help somebody or to change somebody's, you know, world or lifestyle, you gotta put yourself into their world, you know, put yourself in their shoes. Cause I was in the streets and I just know how I used to be when people used to try to like steer me in the right direction that really didn't understand me or my situation, you know, like it'll go one ear and out the other. So we just, you know, I, and I actually, I just left the school. We, we, we uh, me and my partners, we built a school. Well, it is a school, we bought a school, and we rebuilt it and turned it into a, a multimedia facility, you know, just the kids in Chicago that want to find themselves, you know, like your early, you know, years, 14, 15, 16, 17, like those years in high school are really important years, like to the rest of you know, to set you up for the rest of your life. Like that time is so wasted now, like people really don't believe that the, the things you do today, even in high school, even at 14, 15, 16, can either benefit you or hurt you, you know, for the rest of your life. Decisions that you make at 17 years old usually can hurt you for the rest of your life, you know, so. Just that, because I grew up in, in youth centers and you know, after school program. And when I had that, I get out of school at 2.30, from three o'clock to eight o'clock that time, it's just, you know, like, we have a safe place to be, we got a, a hot meal to eat. And just knowing the situation of a lot of, you know, my peers and the way I grew up and the way people around me grew up, a lot of times you don't really have that at home. You don't really have a hot meal. And, and a lot of times you really don't have love and support, so that's the worst if you don't have that at home and the only place you feel it is with people who aren't your family. You really want to grasp onto that. And when you lose that, you lose everything. You lose yourself, you know? So we don't have that at all in Chicago. Like, no more after school matters. No more really boys and girls club, youth centers. You know, I went to a, a, a center on 76 in um, Philip. That's where I grew up, CYC. And it kept us active. We like the Bad, the worst kids in the neighborhood, but we were kids. We were able to still be kids, you know, and now they don't have that anymore. So kids not really able to feel love, feel support, feel a family, feel somebody that actually has their best interests at heart or genuinely cares for them or genuinely want to teach them the tools that they need to apply to their life early on to strive and be what they want to be in life because they don't really understand the stuff that you do today prepares you for the mind, you know? So if you put 80% here and 20% here, you're never gonna get 100% of uh, your crap because you're not putting 100% into your crap. So I just feel like when you, when you, you know, you gotta guide the youth. They don't really understand. A lot of the youth really kids and followers. So when you guide them and push them in the right direction and they look up to you 
you know I went from negative to positive, they want to turn their life around from negative to positive too. So just that little, you know, little things like that that really are big things can can save the city and save the youth. You know, not just one, but hundreds or thousands. You know, so that's a big priority for me to do because the youth really misguided in Chicago. And I was misguided. But luckily, I just had the brains and the smarts and, you know, the heart and the courage and the, the dedication to strive and be everything I am today. Everybody don't have it. Every kid don't have the mindset and the drive that I have, you know. So I want to just be able to help and push in any way that I can, you know, and just let kids know, all right, I'm doing this. They know I ain't nothing but game bangers. All I do is game bangers. But if I could turn my life around and do something positive, so can you. And you may want to. And you know, like, all right, I come from this. I can make my life into this. I wouldn't. You know, so that's one one way I am you know, going to help from Chicago. That's probably the hardest right now for me, um, balancing a relationship between work and a family. You know, it's not hard, but that's probably like one of you know my daily um, one of my daily challenges. You know, because I just had a newborn baby, my son, only four months, and this time is course you know value it's moving fast too like he growing up fast so like right before my eyes i'll be going i literally see him getting bigger on facetime and so it's hard to be able to balance that out you know every day your kid is you know getting bigger or every day your girl at home and she missing you you know so it's hard to balance out but when you got the right agenda i feel like everything just it, it kind of takes care of itself you know because of course, my family know I got all the right intentions, you know. Of course, they know I'm out working for us and I'm not really making any sacrifices unless it's for my family. So, I mean, it's tough to do because you, you tend to try to be both places at once and of course you can't, but I feel like with the right uh, maybe plan, you could you could do both or map it out. Cause I, I do find myself like getting every hour out of the day, even if it's I gotta be here in the studio and be with my son for 10, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour, whatever. I don't care, that's time that I didn't have, that I wouldn't have had before. Had I did another thing, I wouldn't have had that five minutes with my son, 10 minutes with my son for him to see my face, hear my voice, you know, feel my love, you know, so it's just, just gotta have the right intentions and just try to, you know, do the best you can do as a man, as a father, as an artist, you know, nobody's perfect, but you just gotta try to be the best man you can be. In. That's all I'm trying to do. I'm on the Diddy Act, I think. Um, the Diddy Hove Act, you know, you know Hove went from Hove, Jay-Z to Jigger. He just really, and I got a, a, a good explanation for it, of course, but, you know, Lil Herb, I was Herb, just Lil Herb, you know, that's me as a, my dad, Big Herb, you know, so that was my real nickname, Lil Herb, Herb, I was just growing up in the streets, talking about what I my life so I wasn't really like trying to be a rapper I couldn't think of no rap name no rapper gimmick nothing that wasn't me I'm Lil Herb I'm just Herb I'm rapping about my life in the street so it wasn't my rap name it was just my name and I know how to rap you know what I'm talking about my life so that's how Lil Herb came about and G Herbo was just more so like I said when I was young I had to grow up early you know I was around grown men really Playing a grown man game, I was in the streets, I was hustling, taking care of myself, 16. I had moved out of my mom's house already by the time I was like 16, 17. Living on the streets with my friends, wherever I could live, you know, and making whatever money or however I could fend for myself. So I was around 24 year olds, you know, and I'm 16, holding my own weight, on how to really hold a conversation with grown men, 25 year old men that's in the streets, you know, how to hold my weight and know how to really, you know, hold my own. When you 16 and you 17 and you in the streets, you're 25, so you held accountable for all your actions. So for me to be able to stand my ground, I get pushed around, you know, be a leader, make smart decisions at an early age. That's that shows signs of like leadership, and you know, so that's where the G came from. G Herbo, you move like a general, like your own man, you know, like that's where it came. We was never, we never had a leader, you know. We were always like our own leader, our own man, you know, because I learned early on. One of my big homies told me this, you know. Y'all real, man. My big homie always told me, like, if you in a situation where it's only one brain or it's only one leader of the organization and something happened to me, then what? How y'all gonna be able to hold your own? Like, that's one thing. Like, he turned us into bosses early on. Like, 
how to move and maneuver and just think like a man, you know, hustle, whatever you was gonna do, you know what I'm saying? Like, he was the type of, no, you can't be dependent on me, you know? Like, if something happened to me, anything, or, you know, something happened to you, everybody gotta be able to, you know, no one man could think for you, so that's just what that came from, the G Herbo, you know, you move like a general, like a young leader. And Swerbo is, you know, me, because G Herbo, I'm a humble dude, you know, I am a humble beast, and I come from the streets, I seen, People lose money. I had hundreds of thousands of dollars lost. I had cars crashed. And I had friends lost too. So I know anything that's here, like in the physical, you can touch, could be gone tomorrow. So I just don't take life for granted or things for granted, you know. So that's the humble me. I don't really talk about my possessions or talk about money. Either. You know, I work hard. You know, everybody know I work hard and I do what I do and I make sacrifices. So I should make money off what I do. So I shouldn't have to talk about it. You should automatically respect. I got some money, you know, because do what I'm doing. I'm not going to be in no rapper that's out here talking about I'm rapping and putting myself in situations I can't capitalize off of. So, Swervo is, you know, uh, the alter ego of a G Herbo, if I was to say, because I do work hard and I am in the streets and I've been had everything, you know, designed against me for me to fail. Everything was pent against me for me to fail. And I took that situation and I made this situation. So I do deserve to be able to talk about cars that I buy and clothes that I buy and jewelry that I buy because it's a token of me really making a situation, taking a situation where I had nothing and being able to turn into this situation where I almost have everything. It should be a side of you that could motivate the youth to say you could be this too. And that is sort of.